celebrating and, and having these lectures for 25 years now. They used to be called uh, Blue Planet, and some of you may remember them being called Blue Planet, and then they morphed into being called Sea Secrets, and I did some research today, and I believe that years ago there was a, a magazine that Sea Secrets, there was questions that we would take from, from the uh, public, and that little booklet was inside of one of our newspapers that was part of the uh, International Ocean, Ocean, Oceanic or Oceanographic Fe uh, Foundation. And so that name now lives on it in this lecture series. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you to the late Robert uh, Ginsburg for, for doing this. It's And I just want to say thank you to our sponsors tonight. We're very grateful for your support. Uh, Bank of America is joining us for the third year now. We thank you guys so much for, for the support for this wonderful event. I'd also like to uh, thank the Shepherd Broad Foundation, Meredith Ann Dasberg Foundation, Foundation, William J. Galdway III, Esquire, Cheryl Gold, the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, Lois Kerr, Elizabeth C. Lambertson Foundation, Joan McCann Family Foundation, Taylor and, Taylor and Melissa White Fund, um, Myron and Nicole Wang, the Welch Family Foundation, and Southern Glazers uh, Wine and Spirits. If you all would like to join in and become a sponsor of the Rose and Steel School or of the Sea Secrets, you can contact me. Again, my name is Jennifer. I'm here every day in the Dean's office. Um, Shameless plug, but what I'd like to do, just to, not to delay any more for you guys, I would like to introduce Ben Kurtman, who will come up and, and lead us into the rest of the, this evening's activities. Thank you. Sorry, no worries. I crumpled up bits and, bits and pieces of paper here. There we go. They made a nice binder for me and everything. Okay, so um, uh, my job is some introductions today. Uh, first, oh, uh, I'm going to introduce Craig, but before I do that, um, I'm going to introduce uh, Samantha Kramer. Uh, Samantha Kramer is one of our most promising students, and uh, I met her when she was a sophomore uh, undergraduate. And uh, she's amazing, uh, if not crazy. Um, the amazing part is Samantha is, uh, was a, a double or triple major. I think she was going to major in everything in the school, but physics and meteorology were her two passionate interests. I think math was on the list, too. And, and she actually blazed a new trail. We didn't allow double majors in physics and meteorology. It wasn't possible. And Samantha was the first ever to do that. Um, she blew me away as an undergraduate. She uh, uh, came on board as a graduate student and, and really blew me away as a graduate student. Uh, this, is a, this is just a great honor for me to watch her mature into what I think is going to be a superstar scientist in the future. And um, um, oh, there it is. I was waiting for that to pop up. Uh, the other thing I have to mention is we have a, a really nice uh, symposium on Friday afternoon at the Coral Gables campus. It keeps flashing away. It's supposed to stay up there. But there's, there's this little bitty. Uh, uh, um, a web address. You can take a picture of it. That web address is where you can uh, sign up to, uh, to join us. Uh, Bill Weir, who's the uh, CNN environmental, uh, chief environmental reporter for CNN, is going to be the moderator. We have a, a fantastic panel, and uh, we also have a really nice keynote, keynote address. So if you're interested, Friday afternoon at the Coral Gables campus, we're really excited about this event. With that, uh, Samantha, uh, please come up and tell us a little bit about your experiences. All right. Uh, good evening. My name is Samantha Kramer, and I'm a PhD candidate here at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science. And while we are here to celebrate and learn about science, I would first like to speak to the legacy of knowledge uh, ingrained in each former, current, and future student at this institution. So before I was a graduate student, I was also an undergraduate here um, in atmospheric science. In fact, the person that inspired me to be an atmospheric scientist here at UM is actually in this room tonight. Uh, shout out to Chelsea Carlson. 
Um, and not only will I be graduating again this year, but my younger sister will also be graduating with her bachelor's in atmospheric science from Rosenseal. So a little family legacy there. Um, as a student, especially an undergraduate, I did not consider the impact being a meteorologist or being a Rosenseal meteorologist would have. I am proud to be an atmospheric scientist or meteorologist uh, because we are community leaders. And when we have an emergency or a natural disaster, we look to these atmospheric scientists, to these meteorologists for the answers that we need to keep our family safe. Um, and not to mention general research and your daily forecasts and all the different ways the weather affects you. But I'm equally proud to be a Rosen Seal School alumni and current student because of the expectation of excellence and the pride we take in our work. As an undergrad, I was starstruck by all the professors. For example, while teaching us about thermodynamics, Dr. Ben Kurtman also managed to fly around the world and take calls and be a corresponding lead author on the 2013 Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. So to clarify, the IPCC is the Global Scientific Consensus on Climate Change Science, which includes 195 countries. Now that's a lot of interpreters and a lot of arguing and a lot of opinions, but in that time, while flying around the world, Dr. Ben Curtin made sure to be at every single class and enthusiastic because being a mentor was just as important to his legacy as being a scientist. And I am lucky to have him as a mentor today. Over time, I've gotten to know the majority of the professors, not just as mentors, but as scientific rock stars. And how do I know that it's not just me that believes in this? Well, we just returned back from a conference uh, of thousands of meteorologists and atmospheric scientists. And a lot of times you don't see full rooms because there's so much going on. For every single Rosenseal School professor presentation, there was standing room only. Every room was full. And even more amazing, a quarter of that room was Rosenseal alumni and current faculty and students in full support, eager to learn about all of the work that we do here. And that confirms in my mind that we are a global leader in atmospheric research. Um, so tonight we are here to learn about the legacy and the current progress of our seven day forecast. The weather forecast we read every day helps us manage our risks from planning your morning commute to a nice day at the beach or even planning an, a brave outdoor wedding. Here at the Rosenseal School, we are looking forward to the future we are stretching our scientific knowledge to forecast a month out or even a year. Think about the risks that we can mitigate or prepare for with more time. For example, would you schedule installing a new roof if you knew that there was a 90% chance of extreme precipitation at the end of the month? Or would you save up to get that air conditioning fixed if a heat wave is expected? We acknowledge the precedent sent by the scientific legends before us and strive to inspire others. But what really sets the Rosenseal School apart is that all of us are equally inspired and inspiring, and that includes our students. I began research as an undergraduate student. Now, I mean real research, not busy work, but actual data, collection, and analysis because the faculty train us and take the time to add to our confidence. I was in awe when I learned that Saharan dust, yes, dust from the Saharan desert, is picked up in the air and travels to Miami each summer. So we breathe in dust from the Saharan desert here in Miami in the summer months. In fact, if you look at your car after a rainstorm, you might actually see some. And I always check the food ingredients, but I never thought, what's in my air? You know, they don't have a warning label for that. Um, and in fact, we've been measuring Saharan dust here at the Rosenseal School, thanks to Dr. Uh, Prospero, since 1974. 1974. Um, so just as a fun fact, did you know that dust can affect human health, affect the sea surface temperatures, affect hurricane development, provide nutrients to our soil, and affect the Earth's climate? That's a lot of effects for dust. And I was lucky to turn my undergraduate research into a full PhD. When I transitioned from an undergraduate to a graduate, another mentor of mine, Dr. Zaidema, told me, gaining a PhD is not about learning all there is to know. It's about generating new knowledge and finding answers for open questions. So one would think after 46 years of dust collection, what else can I add? What's new? What haven't we learned already? Well, with the guidance of my mentors, we have managed to link the amount of Saharan dust we breathe in each summer to a specific wind pattern. And now that we know this wind pattern, we can use that 
along with advances in weather forecasting, to hopefully predict long-term uh, a product of forecast that we can all use as a community. So we have previously uh, found an undetermined link between our dust weather to our long-term climate in hopes of better understanding and predicting dust effects. I did not expect for the work I do or my time here at Rosenstiel to build a legacy. I have been lucky to work with amazing students and faculty to build my research career, including submitting those very important peer-reviewed papers and generate new knowledge, which will hopefully benefit my local community. But perhaps even more importantly, I have been able to aid in developing and implementing a new outreach program called Students for Students, which brings graduate students into local classrooms to bring the field trip for, to you, and been able to also bring my enthusiasm full circle and inspire and encourage new students to join the program. So thanks to the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, we, we as students are brought to, we learn that science and community are one and the same, and that is why our legacy is unparalleled. Thank you. So you can see there's no, no reason at all to worry about the future. We've got pe people like Sam. It's just very heartwarming. Thank you, Sam. All right, Craig, now it's your turn. Let's get these papers in order. So um, it's, uh, it's been a long time time in the making for us to get Craig here. Uh, some of you may remember that, uh, that a year ago, we were, we were all supposed to be here together to listen to Craig, um, but he blew us off. <laughs> There's this little tiny thing, a government shutdown that got in the way, you know, he's a government employee, can't travel, you know, ah, blah, blah. Anyways, <laughs> a little while later, we finally got Craig here, and you can see we have a full house. Everyone's really excited to hear from Craig. I just want to give you a little brief introduction of uh, Craig. Uh, he's from New Jersey. I'm proud that he's from New Jersey. Uh, Craig started diving somewhere in his early teens, I think it is. Started diving in his early teens. There's a story out there that Craig and his buddies, while they were diving, caught people illegally dumping waste into a river, I believe it is, right? Yeah. They caught them, filmed them diving, busted them. Teenagers. That's a commitment to the environment. Uh, Craig got his uh, bachelor's degree from Rutgers in zoology. Um, I don't want to date anybody, but it was the last millennium. <laughs> uh, and uh, Craig uh, then got involved uh, with the NOAA Commissioned Corps. Did I say that right? Commissioned Corps, right? The NOAA Commissioned Corps. So uh, these are, this is a f uh, officers that uh, help run the NOAA fleet. And Craig was a deckhand and worked, up, worked, worked his way up the ranks. Uh, 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 I think you led the largest ship for NOAA fisheries activities, a 224-foot uh, ship, led the largest ship for NOAA uh, activities. He led NOAA missions to the Titanic. So Craig has a 25-year history with NOAA uh, seagoing operations. And along the way, it's amazing, along the way, he managed to get his law degree in maritime law. I mean, you know, it's people like that that really make me feel inadequate. Uh, but, but Craig managed to get his law degree and, and, and really rose th through the ranks of NOAA. He, he, was, he developed the first ocean explorer program, I believe it's what it's called, first ocean explorer program. Craig, Craig is passionate about many things, but one of the things I hear I, when, I, when I meet with Craig and talk to Craig that he's, that he's very passionate about is the NOAA Sea Grant program. This is a really incredible program that brings the work that NOAA does to the local level, to people on the street that really, really care. And Craig's passion, uh, from my external interpretation, is that he really wants to make sure the science, the stewardship, the service that NOAA does affects our daily lives. And that's, and that's what Craig really brings to the table, and it's it's. It's just a pleasure to be involved with NOAA as the director of the Cooperative Institute, to be part of that process 
of bringing the science we do in our labs, on our computers, that seems so disconnected, and yet ultimately gets down to the person in the street in your weather forecast, in what's happening in the climate, whether your streets are going to flood, whether it's going to be extreme rainfall. And it's that kind of commitment to making sure our science informs our daily lives is what Craig is passionate about. And uh, he's going to tell us a lot about the science that Noah does today. So Craig, please. Thank you very much, Tom. That's very fun. Thank you and good evening. It's, it's a delight to be here, and with a profound sense of apology, it's taken me a year to get here, and I'm very sorry about that delay. But I understand you had a rather excellent presenter last year in Ben Kirkman himself, and I, I think between Samantha's description of the, the benefits of this university and its programs, as you heard, and the likes of Ben, I can say with no reserve, Noah is remarkably fortunate to have a partner in the University of Miami Rosensteel School in doing our climate work, our weather work, and our oceanographic work. And clearly, and without reserve, I must tell you, we would not have a program were it not for the university. Because more than 50% of our science program is performed by scientists who come from the university and this school. So any excellence that Noah might enjoy in our scientific products and any reputation that we might gain for scientific achievement is attributable to the partners that we choose, and we have chosen very carefully, and we're delighted with the partnership that we have with the University of Miami. Thank you very, very much. So the title of my talk tonight is, if you like your seven-day weather forecast, thank an oceanographer. But I'm not gonna tell you a whole lot about meteorology. I may not even tell you a whole lot about oceanography. But I do wanna tell you a bit of a story that carries you through from where we are today to where we might each hope we're going to go in the future. So let me start by asking you to ponder this image. If I lie flat on the ground and look straight up in a darkened sky and see only the universe, I cannot imagine the numbers that are attached to the potential of other planets, other entities, other galaxies, the hundreds of billions of potential stars, planets, and the like that are out there in this universe. It makes my head hurt. I cannot understand the notion of something being beyond infinity. Where is the edge and end of the universe? We could go on. We could discuss these what ifs. And when I really broaden myself to try and talk to astrophysicists, it's a very short conversation because they're a whole lot smarter than I am. But I wind up realizing that things that make sense numerically don't immediately make sense to my visceral understanding of the complexity of the universe or the mathematical theory that underlies it. So I must revert back to something simple. It's not too hard for me to understand. I am in awe of space. But more than being in awe of space, I'm in awe of what is happening on this planet, and I'm concerned about what is happening on this planet. So let me start with an introduction of this planet. And I remember as a young boy, this used to come in a box. This is Cracker Jack. And, and I hope I'm not moving around too much. Somebody please guide me, because I know we have some wonderful people that are in the overflow area and want to give a shout out to the over, overflow folks and thank them for coming out here tonight as well. But Cracker Jack, I'm not here to do a commercial for Cracker Jack. I'm here to do a remembrance of Cracker Jack, because as a young boy, candy-coated popcorn, peanuts, and a prize. That's what you get in Cracker Jack. Who remembers that? Thank you, thank you, OK. So the question that, that we've been pondering is, is there still a prize and a trick inside of Cracker Jack? I don't know, but we're going to find out. But what I have to tell you is, William, we had this discussion in, in the break, and I'm going to ask you to start and pass it on around and enjoy your Cracker Jack. We're going to eat the bag to get to the bottom. I pulled out the little trick when I was a kid, maybe seven or eight. And my mom in New Jersey, my dad in New Jersey, Great parents, they loved their kids, my brother and I. They gave us everything they possibly could, even though they didn't have great material wealth. They had huge wealth of heart. And um, I owe my dad everything I am today because he gave me a lighted pathway, and my mom gave me the reinforcement to say, as I would say to any young person in the audience here tonight, if you believe it, if you could dream it, you can do it. It's just a question of finding those right people that can help you navigate that. So how do you navigate Cracker Jack, right? How do you, how do you take the promise of Cracker Jacks and you open up the prize that you've been waiting for, and it's not a magic decoder ring. It's a simple statement that said, if the polar ice caps melt, 
sea level will rise four feet. And I've remembered that since I was seven years old. And I never thought that we would be in a world today where we had to worry about that happening. But we are, and we do. So there's a great list of questions, a great list of considerations we need to go through, I think, in order to not just ponder the what if and not just treat them as an anecdote in a, in a box of candy, but these are real, real world problems that back in my day, I don't think whoever wrote that ever thought it was anything more than just an abstract calculation. So back to the universe as we ponder the universe. To the, if there are other life forms out there, and there may well be, I don't know that they're particularly concerned about what's going on on this planet, but we certainly are. But imagine if we had the indication that there was a planet out in the ethos that in, and had a poisonous atmosphere by, by dominant form, a life form, but largely in abundance, unrecognizable to us, and that it was a traversable distance. I think we'd spend any number of dollars to try and get there. But that planet, that planet is elusive and it's out there, and we seem to be projecting ourselves towards the interests and concerns of space more than we are projecting ourselves to the interests and concerns of our own planet. And that the romance of space and that, that what if planet is more enticing than the excitement, the discovery, and the thrill of the oceans and being at sea on planet Earth. So without disrespect to either gender, I just go to a cartoon that was generated several years ago in The New Yorker, and the caption is, I don't know why I don't care about what's at the bottom of the ocean, I just don't. And I think that's a reality perspective in a lot of places and in a lot of ways in our society. Yet, it is this planet, it is this home that's 70% covered by water, and that ocean is a very important component to us. So with this introduction and hopefully the enjoyment of Cracker Jacks, I begin with what I'll call chapter one. Why me? How did I get here? Wonderful people like Ben Kurtman and the, and the university chose to invite me, but I go back to, I, I have to say, the, the legacy of Dr. Bob Ginsburg, who was a remarkably able supporter of the young fledgling ocean exploration program, which we started in 2001. And Dr. Ginsburg gave us, in this very environment, in a conference room maybe 150 feet away from here, very sound advice and very good guidance in how we should start that program in 2001. I remember him fondly and I hold him in, in a great deal of respect and high regard. But I also go back to Sea Frontiers, which was mentioned earlier. Sea Frontiers was a noble magazine that I subscribed to as a young boy and it influenced me greatly because it was written at a higher level than I could immediately understand, but it sent me to the library to learn more. And it was written by people who I came to respect, and largely they were members of your science community and the heritage of this fine institution. So once again, I go back with thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. But now, why me? How did I get here? So let me go to a river that went ablaze back in 1969, the Cuyahoga River. Many of you would remember that. That was a, a remarkably upsetting environmental period. It was in the wake of Rachel Carson's science, Silent Spring. It was in the, the rising of Jacques Cousteau as he introduced the oceans to us. But something I didn't know until I looked this up was that 13 times previously did the Cuyahoga River ablaze and, and light up. So the problems that we were facing in the 60s and leading into what became a great environmental decade they had been around for a long time. We had been polluting for a long time. We had been denying the reality of what's happening around our, our feet and our knees and our children for a long time. And then finally it got to be enough that people chose to do something about it. And the result of that was an environmental legacy and legislation of the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Marine Sanctuaries Act, the Anti-Dumping Act. Many other laws came into place and we have the benefit of those laws today because our air is cleaner, our water is cleaner. And I've seen it in my lifetime and I think you've seen it in your lifetime. But I didn't start out on the Cuyahoga, I started out on the Passaic River. Now if you're from there, it's pronounced the Passaic River. You gotta put the shoulder into it, it's northern New Jersey. <laughs> it's the Passaic River by, by proper pronunciation, but growing up there, that was my river. There was plastic refuse, there was debris, um, and unfortunately an occasional person floating down the river who was not in good health. And, and it, was, it was an interesting place to grow up, but very disappointingly for me, as I go back there now, the cadmium, the mercury, and the, the poisons that are in the sediments in what is declared as a, a Superfund site today, it is a Superfund site. I grew up on a Superfund site with, as you can see in this slide, 
half of this, this beach or this bank is likely inundated at high tide. My backyard was half inundated at high tide. That's where I grew up. And today still, plastic, debris, detritus of, of human origin rather than natural origin. And uh, it, it's a dirty river. But the sediment has been recovered, and I know not whether or not the fish are recovering, but I have to have faith that the Environmental Protection Agency and the state agencies are doing the best of their ability to right a harm that was done over the course of 100 years. But on this river, I grew to, to appreciate the frustration of not being able to swim up to a certain age in that river because it was far too polluted. And it was pretty remarkable that I actually decided to go and take a brief career in commercial diving to get in that river and several others to the point where I'm now dedicated to leave both my liver to science and any other <laughs> organs that, that persist thereafter. Paid my college bills. I learned a lot of responsibility early, but the only way I got to go diving was because my dad, who couldn't afford to pay for my diving lessons, told me that if I got a job, he would drive me to those diving lessons, and we did. And I met amazing people in the shadow of New York City, where this diving facility was located, including names that you would recognize who are photographers in National Geographic and people who were very key to do good things for the environment and, and the world. That's where I got my inspiration to do the amazingly reckless things that I wound up doing. So after my entry into a career in NOAA, piloting ships, eventually captaining ships, I really grew to enjoy and appreciate every aspect and everything about the oceans and wondered how I could cause a greater effect to make people pay attention to the problems that we do have and be constructive in the solutions. I realized at one point in time that we're probably, there were probably a dozen more men and women aside me who could do what I was doing, and I wanted to find something that was a little bit more unique. And I feel very grateful for the opportunities that were presented to me by other people because I believe I have found it in the position that I'm able to have now. So I'm here as a spokesperson for this cause, a little bit of background, wise guy from New Jersey, trying to do the right thing in a much larger world than I ever thought I'd be able to participate in as a youngster. So now let's return to the ocean and let's look at that mysterious planet that we talked about. If we knew there was a planet out there that had life on it, but alien by dominance to our human form, that it was surrounded by a toxic environment where we could not breathe or sustain our human life, and well, the, it could go on, but really, I've just described planet Earth for you because the dominant life form is not we humans. There are diverse life forms throughout in the ocean. We cannot breathe air, excuse me, we cannot breathe water. It is a hazardous, toxic environment for us. Yet we find ourselves here living at the margins on a small percentage of that 30% that's land. And we cannot live in that 70% of surface area that is water. It's a much higher percentage in terms of the total biosphere of the ocean. So if you look at the ocean, and you have a fondness for the ocean, and you look at seven and a half billion people that populate this earth, and then you look at a representation of how much water actually is spread across the surface of the ocean, as a colleague of mine would, would liken it, it's like taking a basketball, dumping it in water, in a tub of water, and that water that persists in the three-dimensional space of the basketball texture is what you have in the oceans. Put a few peaks and valleys in there and you've got the diversity of, of the bathymetry. But there's really not a lot of water. So for seven and a half billion people, soon to be, you pick the number, you pick the date in the future, it's not incomprehensible for us to realize that that little bitty river I grew up on where people were throwing things into it for the past hundred years is no different than what we've been doing to the world's ocean for the past hundred plus years. It's not a lot of water to cause a human effect on times the number of people that we have on Earth. And similarly, if you look at the atmosphere and realize the thin layer of gas that we have surrounding this planet, that the products of our lifestyle and the products of our technical progress have been deposited into that gaseous space to alter the gas that we evolved with causes some moment of concern to figure out where we're going in the future based on this. So back to the ocean. If you consider that only 95, excuse me, only 5% of the ocean has been explored, leaving 95% unexplored, not visited by humans, not really known what is there, what critters, creatures, life forms, ecosystems, and the like are there. We've got a rather delicate planet. So how do we turn that around and, and reach the 95%? Another key answer to this is that roughly 90, 95% of the biosphere is the ocean, where creatures live and where life forms can be found. And some of those life forms are remarkably alien to us. And in Ben's introduction, he, he 
recognized my graduating from Rutgers in 1979. And I would remind you that it was quite interesting because this, this form of, of life, these tube worms in the Galapagos Rift were discovered in 1978. And I wasn't smart enough to realize at the time that I should have asked for my tuition back because everything I was taught about plants are over here and animals are over there and good luck for everything else in between because there's not much, well, that's the much. And it wasn't as simple as a, a bifurcated plant and animal kingdom, but that was what our belief was and that's what we were being taught. Now, I'm 62 years old. You don't have to do the math. I'm 62 years old. And in my adult lifetime, we have absolutely revolutionized our understanding of what life forms are on Earth and where we came from. To me, that's remarkable. It's embarrassing as a human race that thinks we are so progressed that we can get to the moon and we're just visiting the Mid-Atlantic Ridge around about the same time that Aldrin and Armstrong settled down on the surface of the moon, that we'd be visiting the Mid-Atlantic Ridge for the first time in Project Famous, which was a US-French undersea expedition. I hope we get back to doing that, and I think we will. More on that to follow. But how do we convey and communicate the importance of the oceans? What tools do we use? How many people have seen this in your textbook growing up? It's the oxygen cycle. It's the carbon cycle. It's what we know. How many people have seen this image growing up? Using the ocean. Not many. Just the young people that are here. Thank you very much. And I appreciate your, your, your signifying that you've seen that. I'm delighted to realize that some schools are now teaching that and some textbooks can now teach that. But the mindset of the majority of the human race is to believe that it's trees that are giving us all the oxygen. And an equal amount comes from the ocean, as we know. So a couple of things come to mind now about the ocean that's, that's really amazing. But first off, how do we communicate that? A, a very fine publication that communicates ocean-related factoids is also known as the Snapple caps. And how many people, <laughs> how many people are familiar with the, uh, the conveyance of Snapple caps for oceanic information? OK, the first one is, just shout them out if you know them. The first one here is, the first sailing boats were built in what country? A lot of mariners out there. First sailing boats, think of early civilization. Egypt. Somebody said Egypt. Egypt, according to Snapple, the authority, Egypt is there. OK, what is the only animal that can turn its stomach inside out? Starfish. Starfish, thank you very much. Undisputable authority, indisputable authority, excuse me. OK, um, what animal is made of about 95% water? Jellyfish, very good. All right, last one, bring it home. Last one here. OK, I'm going to have to make this a true or false one, because this is kind of tough. Seals sleep only for one and a half minutes at a time. True or false? False. I'm going with the true gang, because it's on a Snapple cap. So, I don't dispute anything that's on here, but think of the creativity of Snapple to try and put a positive public consumable message, kind of like the Cracker Jack guys back in, in my day. Where else can we be communicating? Is it the textbooks? Are there other ways and places that we could be reaching people to understand at a greater level of, a greater level of knowledge how important the oceans are and how the oceans affect our everyday life? And that if we mess with them or mess them up, we're messing with something of ourselves. All right, now we've been at this for a couple of minutes, but maybe another factoid about the oceans. I figured I'd introduce this for just a moment. <laughs> and I've been here for 20 minutes? All right. So if you consider seawater, you thought there was something else in here. If you consider seawater and you pour a quantity of seawater into a vessel and realize that not only is there roughly 36 parts salt, but there's possibly up to a million microbes can fit in a shot glass of seawater. Does that astound you? For those of you who are microbial enthusiasts, you probably know that already. But for those of you who don't, it depends on where you get your sample, but it is not unlikely to find up to a million microbes in a shot glass of seawater. <laughs> so this is something for us to, to consider seriously. <laughs> and remembering that my degree, I don't impuse, impugn my, my um, 
academic institution because I, I believe I got one of the finest educations I could, I could possibly achieve. But that's where science was at the time. But one, once more, another embarrassment to we, the human race, that the most abundant microbe in the world for which we depend on the oxygen that is generated was only discovered in the late 2000s. It has the simplest DNA encapsulation. Scientists in the Oregon State University discovered it. And basically, it is the microbe that breaks down other organic matter and reintroduces the nutrients that are necessary for photosynthesis. And we didn't know it was there. Why? Because we never looked. It's as simple as that. So as we conclude chapter two, let's move on now to NOAA. So NOAA is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. It was founded in 1970. It was a result of a presidential panel and a national ocean strategy that asked that there be created an agency to be the NASA of the, of the undersea. But in addition to the ocean component, there was a request to generate an understanding of the air-sea interaction. All the tools that brought us through the Second World War of undersea sensing and even atmospheric sensing and radar indicated that there was a profound relationship between the atmosphere and the ocean, but it was an unquantified one. And in order to get to understand what it was, NOAA was asked to go ahead and do that. The part of NOAA that I'm responsible for, and I'll go over the other parts very briefly for you, is that, is the oceanic and atmospheric research challenge that was given to the nation. And we've been doing this for now 50 years. NOAA's beginning to celebrate our 50th anniversary. We've been around a long time. And the result of the question, what is the air-sea interaction, what is that relationship, is today known as climate science. We didn't set out to study climate. We set out to answer the interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. And the answer is climate science. And for folks who are troubled by climate and climate policy solutions, please do, not excuse, please do not confuse climate science, which is a richly understood body of work, with climate policy, which is a continuing public debate and will be a continuing public debate. But in NOAA, we realized we finally made it, because we made it to the cartoons. And if you, <laughs> this cartoon was actually generated the same time that a paper was published in Science that talked about my Cracker Jack box, the melting of the Greenland ice sheet, and, and the fact that it was melting at a far more accelerated rate than had ever been forecast or expected to occur. So Bennett, who is widely published, and you've probably seen much of his work, he chose to use Noah tongue-in-cheek in his comic. And frankly, I was delighted, because not too many years ago, if you Googled Noah, you realize Google could be conjugated, right? But if you Googled Noah, you'd get the answer, did you mean NASA? <laughs> we don't have to worry about that anymore, because we're now understood by the public to the point where a cartoonist has confidence that the public knows enough about NOAA. OK, fine. So what, what does NOAA do? Let me take you to a chart now that's generated by the OECD. It's an international body. It's UN affiliated. And it deals with economics and risk in the world. And if you look at this index here of height of impact, greater impact up here, and greater likelihood, if you're up here, you've got some problems. You've got high probability of high impact. And what are those? If you can read them in the back, um, I'll stop. But just a show of hands, can you read that in the back? No, OK. So right up here, highest probability of likelihood, highest impact, extreme weather events. NOAA is responsible for issuing forecasts and warnings and assessments into the future on extreme weather events. Next one, failure of climate change mitigation and adaptation. We are responsible for developing and, and promulgating the science to the public so it could be understood and used in wise policy making. The caution is failure of that the policy makers might not understand or embrace or take on board what that climate science is. But we have no problem with the science. But performing that works up here as well. Natural disasters, biodiversity lost and ecosystem collapse, water crises, national disasters, man-made environmental disasters. That's what we are responsible for telling you all about or if they're coming. So from an economic perspective, we have a pretty important job. Let me go through another level of examination and evaluation of what we're supposed to do. These are the questions we're supposed to answer on a daily basis. How many fish are in the sea? 
No one? All right. I'm going to check the overflow room and see if they've got an answer. <laughs> That's a pretty good answer. That's a pretty good answer. But the problem we have is we have to manage the fishery. So we can't have an abstract. We have to have a, a quantity. And we need to set quotas because NOAA actually has, through the National Marine Fishery Service, a very old and important part of what became NOAA, we have to manage the nation's fisheries. We have to make sure that there's a sustainable amount of protein that's harvestable in the United States and, and not blow it, not overfish. We overfished heavily in the 70s, and we're just now really reaching our points of recovery on many of those fisheries. So how many fish are in the sea, and what is the habitat these fish live in? What are their marine mammal and endangered species engagements and encounters with it? It's a complex question. We have to answer that every day. Here's the easy one. What's the weather going to be like tomorrow? Our National Weather Service provides you with that information and those answers. There's a commercial industry that adds on to what the National Weather Service does for you. We don't provide the forecast to the winery. We don't provide the forecast to the XYZ trucking company. Private sector entities do, but they do so based on the information that you provided with your tax dollars, the satellites, the models, the forecast systems, the radars, all the tools that we have to our avail. What will the weather be like tomorrow? That's our National Weather Service. The next one, what's the weather going to be like 10, 150, 500, 1,000 years from now? That's climate. And we are responsible in NOAA for providing the nation with a climate assessment and effectively a forecast of what the American future is going to look like based on climate impacts. Then the last one, are we wise to be building on shifting sands? That's coastal zone management. You see the ecclesiastical level of these, these questions here. They're high order. But, but truly, we have a program that's called the Coastal Zone Management Program, and it's designed to establish consistency across neighboring coastal states so that there is a unified level of implementation of management of our coastal environment, balancing development with preservation so that the coasts are not negatively impacted overall. We also in NOAA measure the ocean. We conduct a number of cruises by ships that you see the cruise tracks here. We cover the world along with the academic universities and the university ships of the United States, the UNOL ships, which you're very familiar with. And we do this once again with academic communities and with other countries in order to cover the globe. But we're responsible for many of these lines in order to take measurements of the temperature, depth, and the character of the ocean. We do that with ships like the NOAA ship Ronald H. Brown. We also deploy devices like these, which are called Argo floats, and they sink down to 2,000 meters, and they come back up in a short period of time, about 10 days in cycle. And we've conducted at least 2 million of these profiles of the ocean in a manner of measurement that we never could have achieved with just research ships alone. We also are managing the, the index of greenhouse gases. So we monitor to parts per trillion, based in Boulder, Colorado, in a laboratory out in Boulder, all of the gas collections that come from around the world with parts per trillion analysis in order to determine how much CO2 and other greenhouse gases are in the, in the world, in the atmosphere. This map shows you where in the world we take those samples from. Now, we also are responsible for weather forecasting and weather detection. And I think you're familiar with our neighbors here who actually people from your school are sitting in the back of our airplane and conducting the science and conducting the surveys and penetrating those hurricanes. And that's a mighty, mighty courageous thing to be doing. I made a flight through Hurricane um, Sandy. And I want to say to all the people who are on board that flight how noble and gracious they are because my constant screaming did not turn out to be a distraction in any way to the very serious and important work that was going on. So thank you to all those that were on board. Let's move on now to chapter four. The ocean is largely unexplored. I went back to the notion that we don't have much more than 5% of the ocean that has been explored. We have some amazing people that really pursue this. These are not those people. These are styrofoam heads that we bring with us on occasion and shrink down along with styrofoam cups. And here's a tiny little cup that I'll share with you and you can enjoy and take a look at. But that originally started out to be a normal sized styrofoam cup. Styrofoam is compressed with many gases. And once under pressure, the styrofoam liberates those gases and you wind up with just the shell of the plastic or the material. And they're cute little souvenirs that really commemorate the expedition. This one was on the Titanic, didn't touch the Titanic, but it went down on the Titanic expedition. Speaking of which, a magnificent ship that's part of our human history, a great Greek tragedy, if you will, that took 1,523 lives, very similar to the number of people that we lost in the World Trade Center calamity. 
And it's, um, it's a remarkable piece of maritime history. NOAA had three expeditions to the site because there was a law that was passed that asked us to look into the propriety of declaring the Titanic site a maritime memorial. This is the first time a maritime memorial was ever created outside of US jurisdiction. And we have several countries that have joined that agreement and we're, we're very proud to see where we are right now in protecting that shipwreck. But what's most compelling about it is not the interesting nooks and crannies and bits of cases of wine and liquor that sit on the bottom, but it's a grave site. And there were people who came to rest on this grave site. And what was, was most interesting was a commercial salvage expedition was lawfully undertaken in order to collect parts and materials of what's on the ocean bottom. But part of NOAA's heritage is heritage asset management and marine submerged cultural resource, AKA shipwrecks of hist historic significance. And we were asked to provide evidence to the court, which we did, and we explained that while the court was trying to protect the mainstream body of the shipwreck, which was remarkably um, represented in Jim Cameron's movie, The Titanic, never mind the love story, but the, but the visual imagery was remarkably accurate. The court was protecting the shipwreck, and there were about 100 people's remains that were in that shipwreck. But everyone else, the 1,522, came to rest in the debris field. And the evidence that we collected there in the course of just studying and assessing the scene led the court to realize that, ah, maybe we shouldn't be picking material up out of the debris field because that is where those people came to rest. But great explorers started rather early, and many of them came from this institution and others from the precursors of NOAA to what we know today. But the migrated pattern of exploration goes way back to early man, and the desire to realize that the stars were out of reach in those days, but we could reach into the ocean and do so with gusto. A lot of keen ideas have come about and been repeated, mechanical and robotic suits. And we also have the advent of some of the more sophisticated, we'll call that today sophisticated, rebreather apparatus. Maybe someday we're breathing water. Maybe someday we're doing something physiologically that we can't do today. We've gone from sail research vessels to steam, and from steam to diesel. And we've even had, with Project FLIP and other devices, very similarly designed keen ideas that keep coming so that we can learn and explore more about the ocean. But our frontier today is using autonomous equipment, and here you see the wave glider, which is solar and wave powered. It's a two-part vehicle design that is almost like a perpetual motion machine. There are several. There's also a sail drone, which works with wind power. And each of these, if they lose their principal mode of, of propulsion, either wave power or wind power, they have solar panels to put a little electric motor in and cart them along until the next gust or the next wave comes along. We're basically seeing the cost of exploration and the cost of the tools that we use to explore go down in both size and also cost. So it's an exciting and remarkable time to be in this field. We have in NOAA our own what's called Deep Discover. It's a 6,000 meter remotely operated vehicle. It takes remarkable photographs like the clarity of this, what we call a Dumbo octopus, and uniquely, he's all coiled up. We hadn't seen this little critter do that before. Normally, you see Dumbo with his, his tentacles extended and his arms extended, but um, quite unique features like this um, Venus flytrap anemone. This guy's a curiosity. Exploration is wonderful. This isn't Mars, ladies and gentlemen. This is planet Earth. This is under your oceans. This little guy is a spider that, um, a, a spider crab that has single-celled muscles surrounded by protein and an exoskeleton, and that's about all he's got. He's a tiny little, very frail, fragile thing. This guy, photographed by Bruce Strickett, who is one of the chief pilots up on Alvin, normally an octopus, if you're near him with a mechanical arm, he'll run away after the first tactile encounter. This guy chose to make a rather intimate introduction to the mechanical arm of the, of the, uh, of the submersible. And then speaking of squids and, and the like, this is Edie Witter's photograph, Edie Witter from Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, of a giant squid, which has been a remarkably elusive creature. We're starting to cover down on these things. We're starting to find and see these things. A beautiful holotherian that is, is lit with color that we could only bring, not in artificial light, but this would be surface light that we reproduce under sea. And this one, this one's fun. This is, well, how many people have seen a volcanic um, eruption? How many people have seen a volcanic eruption under sea? This was the elusive mother load of, of uh, geological quest, is to understand where a lot of venting was taking place, but to get to those sites, I'll do that one more time for you because it's really exciting. 
but to get to those sites and actually capture an undersea volcano. Now, if this were on land, we could never be as close as the observing platform is, sensing chemically and visually. And you can't get too close because that water can be superheated and actually bring a little bit of a problem to the thermal integrity of the viewports, whether it's on a camera lens or whether it's on a submersible. This was not a submersible. This was done with a remotely operated vehicle. Then we have other creatures like this interesting vampire squid, which looks like nothing now. This comes, to our, uh, comes with our, uh, from our friends from the exploration vessel Nautilus, Bob Ballard's exploration ship. He's a partner of ours. Now, just watch this guy. When he gives you a flash of those brilliant eyes, you know you're looking at a vampire. That's a vampire squid. It's an amazing creature. A, a new species, this little Casper octopus. This guy is a very interesting jellyfish. I'll not run him through the, the uh, motion, but this one I love. We don't know what it is. <laughs> we don't. And, and you know, for a little bit of me, I want to keep it that way. Because we need to keep reminding people that there are unknowns in the ocean, and it's your ocean, and it's right under your feet, it's right in your backyard. And the fact that you folks come out here tonight to show your interest and share your curiosities with mine is inspiring to me. And we need to get to the point where we're beating back that 95% that we don't know. So let's move on to chapter five now. The future is now. Planet Earth is changing. We know that. Anyone who is skeptical about the changes of planet Earth is probably choosing to deny the presentation of information that's counter to that principal assumption. But as thinking creatures, we have to keep our minds open to new information at all times. Just looking across this, and I hope once again it's not too small for the folks in the back, the air surface temperature on Earth is clearly going up. Humidity is increasing. We see that in the expression of greater rainfall in tropical cyclones. The lower atmosphere temperature is going up. Glaciers are decreasing. Snowpack is decreasing. Ocean heat content, measured by those Argo floats that I showed you, we're seeing that go up. Arctic sea ice is declining faster than we ever had imagined. Sea surface temperature going up. Global sea level going up. Each of these is well documented, richly measured, and many of the scientists from this fine institution and from NOAA are very rigorously engaged in making these measurements. These are indisputable. And we take these and we model them and we can look at data that we've got in the storage locker, use that data, and model it forward to see whether we get to where we know we are today. Today is a known. And the history is a known. And if our models can match in hindcast where we are today, we know that those models should be reasonably reliable for our future projections. And then put that into context. If you look at 400,000 years ago and where we are today, many people might say, ah, the Earth has had this kind of CO2 before. The problem with that argument, though it's not wrong, is that humans have not participated in that journey when the CO2 was higher. Humans started to show up, depends on how you want to define Homo sapien, but the, but the Homo component, the Homo genus, started to appear 400,000 years ago or so. And you look at, at the comings and goings of CO2 and analogously temperature on Earth. We've never been here before, ladies and gentlemen. We're actually about 10 more above this right now, 10 parts per, per million. We've never been here before. And humans evolved through a very long course of time without this level of CO2. That's concerning. So where are we going now? If we look at seafood consumption, the orange is a representation by the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. It shows us what the open ocean capture of seafood is. You see that leveling out, which has taken place for decades. There's not much more capacity in the natural ocean to be extracting fish. The delta is coming from aquaculture. We just visited the university's aquaculture installation this afternoon. It's very impressive. But where is that industry developing in the United States? We have some challenges that we need to meet in order to join the rest of the world, which seems to be enjoying the economic prosperity, but also the production of protein for citizens that we wind up buying from other countries. We haven't gotten ourselves organized to do so in the United States. But aquaculture of all kinds holds great promise. As we go on into the future and look at alternatives to energy that is renewable, as we look at the Port of Miami potentially visited by container ships that have no crew aboard, the potential of fully autonomous ships visiting our ports, we're going to need more accurate weather forecasts, we're going to need more accurate climatological forecasts, more accurate maps, and the introduction of many of these components of oceanographic sensing devices. So let me jump now to show you where these Argo floats are distributed. There's about 4,000 of them in the world. 50% of them are paid for by NOAA and the United States government. 
but NOAA is the, the actor for that, and we're proud of that. And the other 50% come from about 36 or so other countries. But if I can show you right now here, we're sitting comfortably in Miami. And if we know what's going on in Texas today, we pretty much know what's going to go on in Miami tomorrow. Not bad? Everybody agrees. If we know what's going on in California or maybe even Hawaii, we have a pretty good idea in three to five days what's going to happen in Miami. And you start going back and farther and farther back. And then you come to discover and learn about phenomena like El Nino and the, re the reverse of temperature in the coastal waters off of central equatorial South America. And you start working backwards and backwards and backwards through this area called the Indonesian throughput where the Indian Ocean empties into the Pacific. The Indian Ocean has influence on the Pacific, which has influence on Hawaii and the Pineapple Express and atmospheric rivers that you've probably heard about. And that helps us decide, not just in Miami, but in Spain, in England, in Italy. We're getting global weather based on the observations that we're making from these deployed oceanographic stations. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why and how, if you like your seven-day weather forecast, <laughs> you need to thank an oceanographer. Now, these are not cheap, but these are important bumper stickers for us to have. So where are we going with, with what is on the, on the future for us. I've neglected so far to mention <clears throat> one of the other compelling issues that is, is upon us. Excuse me. And that is the concern we have over <coughs> ocean acidification. How many people are familiar with ocean acidification? OK, very, very good. Thanks. So I probably don't need to do this, but it's a whole lot of fun to break things and destroy things and such. So I'm going to take a piece of chalk, which represents the calcium in shells of either coral or mollusks. And that calcium, Ben, you're going to check me now. It's nothing up the sleeves. Wait, 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 wait. OK, nothing in there so far. All right, so we're going to accelerate with time the acidity of the ocean. This is plain Goya distilled white vinegar. It's obviously more concentrated than the seawater we're talking about. But we're going to see what happens to the stick of chalk with some calcium in it. And we'll see how well this works. I'm not going to drink this. <laughs> so we'll let that sit here for a little while. You can start to see a little bit of fizzing and fuzzing coming out of it if you're up there in the front row. But there's a chemical reaction that takes place. The acidity of the seawater does not allow calcium to form in, in a structure that many organisms are dependent upon. So where are we going with all these challenges and problems that we have? The United Nations passed 2015 a prospective agenda for a better world in 2030 and set objectives for the year 2030. One that is really keen for us is number 14, which you definitely can't read at this scale, but it's, it's life below water, it's oceans, basically. And we're dedicated to that. One of the jobs that I have is to represent the United States at something that's called the Intergovernmental Panel, uh, it, excuse me, I almost went to climate change. The, the, um, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission, the IOC, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission. And we set out and presented to the United Nations a proposal that we have an international decade of ocean science for sustainable development. There are plenty of international decades. We're in, I think, nine right now, nine or 10 right now. People don't really know them or pay attention to them. But what we're compelled to do is make sure that we do, and hopefully you do, pay attention to the promise and the prosperity of this decade. These are the objectives that the decade hopes to achieve, which is to establish clean ocean, a healthy and resilient ocean. In other words, the, the, the human population living along the shores is resilient to the impact of the ocean. Our ability to predict the ocean would be enhanced. That the ocean can be safely inhabited by coastal residents. That we achieve sustainability in the fisheries and other protein products that come from the ocean, but that we don't over harvest. And that the ocean, is, the ocean information is transparent and available to all. In order to get there, we have set out a couple of key objectives. I'll just go over a couple of these. One of them is to truly produce a map of the ocean. We don't have a good map of the ocean today. Pages of National Geographic give us a, a cartographic representation, but at what scale? And when you start to look and realize the scaling of ocean mapping, it is incomplete and insufficient for us to do the science that we need to have. And we look at ocean observations of a different kind and different caliber. We need ocean observing systems that are standardized across the globe, locally targeted, but fit for purpose 
across the globe. We don't have them in sufficient density in the Arctic or the Antarctic, and also in most of the major ocean basins. Even though that diagram I showed you with the 4,000 Argo floats, if you realize that the distance between Argo floats on average is about 400 kilometers, that's a huge spacing. An inventory of ecosystem components, a data portal, you, you could read these and see what we're headed towards. These are big picture things that, but for the decade, but for all the nations of the world focusing on this, we wouldn't have a chance to do this. And we're gonna do it and do it well. So, the epilogue here, the future is now. This is what may concern a number of us. Is what we're teaching in business school matching what we need to be doing in society writ large? That's an ongoing debate, and I'm sure you have your view as I, I do have mine. If you position the world in the right place on Google Maps, you could almost eradicate any sense of land. You're just seeing the shadow of Mexico and California. It looks like Baja up in the upper right, and you've got a bit of New Zealand, but there's a massive ocean there that we've not really tackled just yet. I talked about ocean mapping. Here's Miami. And if we look at the standard scale of mapping around the world of the ocean, you would lose the fidelity of the harbor entrance to Miami, and it would look like this, in just a simple collection of pixels of one to two to maybe four kilometers. And this beige, or I'm not really good at colors, this reddish color here, right here, these are the areas of the US exclusive economic zone that are unmapped. So if it's blue, we've mapped it with high resolution multi-beam echo sounders. But all these areas, we've not mapped. So we have a long way to go yet. We're gonna get there with new tools, we're gonna get there with new devices and new mechanisms. And for those of you who might be somewhere near my vintage, you remember PF flyers? <laughs> Run faster, jump higher. Right, is it all coming back to you now? The Cracker Jacks, the PF Flyers. We're gonna have to run faster and jump higher, but we believe we can with tools like the Decade, with tools like the ambition that our current NOAA leadership has inspired us to be promoting the blue economy and following ways to find sustainable development and sustainable activities in the US exclusive economic zone, but also the world's oceans, and also to improve our weather forecasts. So I've jumped ahead of myself here, but I ask you to slap on the hard hat Buckle up and join us on the journey. And I say thank you very much for your attention tonight. What you do, Craig? It's dissolving. <laughs> Any questions for Craig? We have time for questions? We are completely government funded. We are a government agency. So you're still getting the money in spite of We are still getting our money. The current budgetary situation for NOAA is rather healthy. And as you may recall, the Congress decides what funds to appropriate and then presents to the president a bill to be signed. The president's request to the Congress is a suggestion of what he thinks are, are the priorities for the nation. The president has been requesting consistently in the current administration around a 42 to 46 percent decrease for our research and putting the money in other priorities. The Congress has in turn come back and said full funding plus in some cases a little bit more. So our programs are, are well and solidly funded and the Congress has paid remarkably close attention to what the needs are in weather, in climate, and in oceanography. But we Thank can always use more. I appreciate your, your perspective. I have an anti-lobbying law that lets me oh, not I respond to that question. I'm just saying mm -hmm. that the whole room mm -hmm. should know that. We can. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. What is the denial of uh, certain governments climate change affect your, your research and your work? Excellent question. There is a philosophy that is um, inattentive to climate currently in the executive branch. And how does that affect our work? We were able to produce the National Climate Assessment. We were able to produce the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, as, as Dr. Kurtman had worked on and others. But as an independent academic, 
his work and all the others has to get reviewed through by the government, in other words, NOAA and other federal agencies to review it and then pass it forward with an affirmation that this, this summation represents the science. And we were able to produce those, those products and get them out and into circulation. It, it becomes challenging in certain debates that we might have internally, but we've been able to produce the products that the Congress has asked for us, the national climate assessments and to participate in, in the IPCC work. In fact, my deputy, a woman named Co Barrett, is the vice chair, one of three vice chairs of the IPCC, and she's been able to continue in that work uh, without distraction. Now, I will say, NOAA has been remarkably fortunate in the people who were sent by the administration to run NOAA, Tim Gallaudet being one of them, a PhD in oceanography, Neil Jacobs, a PhD in atmospheric sciences, and um, they understand climate science. They are committed to, to um, allowing climate science to move forward. Um, you could read the same newspapers I do. It's not always apparent that that's happening in all other agencies. But uh, we've, we've been very fortunate with the people who are assigned to NOAA by the current administration. Thank you. We have one right here. Uh, beginning every year in June, for those of us who love living in South Florida, we have the tropical hurricane season. And we begin looking at these spaghetti models on television uh, that are the hurricane forecast charts. And there are so many, I guess that's why they call them spaghetti models. Uh, there's a great deal of emphasis that's played um, on the European model. Can you explain a little bit about how these models work and why are there so many and which one could be the most accurate? The most accurate is your weather forecaster. Because the spaghetti models represent a, a, a total chaos of every possible model run. And when the news media gets out and makes a story about the spaghetti models versus what your forecaster, who's just a couple miles away from you here, is telling you that you need to be attentive to in order to be safe, there's no single model that performs the best overall. Now, the media, the media doesn't like good stories. The media likes contention and conflict. So the media extrapolates any difference between what are US models, plural, might be showing versus any other models. Now, the Europeans have a good model, but the model that we just introduced, which is talk code, is the finite volume cubed model. That model performs better with the Europeans' collected data than theirs does. So in other words, our model is better. But how is it that we're collecting the information from the satellites and packaging it is something we need to work on because there's a competitive edge between us and the Europeans as to who's got the most routinely accurate model. But the National Weather Service forecasters look at all the models, and they know how each model behaves in different circumstances because every storm is different. And their years of experience come into a very knowledgeable base that you might wave a wand and say, one day artificial intelligence is going to do the same thing. But I'd not want to replace, I would never replace with, a, with an artificial intelligent computer our National Weather Service forecasters. They have the history, and they have the commitment. Because if you read their work, they sign their work, They'll even put their cell phone numbers down when southern Florida or any part of the coast is about to be hit by something. And to make sure that people understand the severity of the warning, they're putting that out. So the spaghetti models are a curio. And listen to your National Weather Service forecasters, because they're the people that your mayors and your governors are listening to. They are expert, and they're well-practiced and remarkably skillful in their jobs. Thank you. Question here. In, in St. Louis, I'm going to travel around. I love to go in museums, and I, I, there was a NASA exhibit for kids to play with rovers. I work with middle-aged kids, and I just wondered if Noah can do something to, it, to get that fascination that there is for space, space exploration, for the ocean, that 5%, 95% you speak of. I think that's an excellent suggestion. Something that I, I appreciate about NASA is that at the time of their creation, the Space Act gave NASA the latitude to allocate 10% of their budget to education, inspiration of younger generations wanting to get into technical professions, and the likes of which we in NOAA, number one, don't have such a, a uh, grace of latitude in order to implement. And number two, once you establish a program, it's hard to reduce the science by the 10% to put it into the communication, the education, 
or, or the inspiration side, but NASA does it marvelously, I agree. We have some programs that dabble in it. I think our National Marine Sanctuaries program, they're just obviously down the, down the waterway from you here in, in the Keys, but they're all over the country, and the Sanctuary program does a very good job of it. The Ocean Exploration Program has carried that forward. There's a few others that have some more imaginative levels of participation. I'll tell you one that's an interesting factoid. The Exploration Program has over a million classroom lesson plans downloaded a year around the globe. People are using it all over the world. And those lesson plans are tied to the expeditions, some of which I showed you the, the products thereof. And maybe inspire some movies like Martian. They get real wild about that. You could get them. We have an ally in Jim Cameron. He's, he's keen in the underwater. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm an alumni of Grassmas, and I really enjoy about two decades ago, every lunch, sometimes we go to Noah across the street and have a lunch box for hurricane predictions, all those models about two decades ago. I have a two-stage question. The first one is about local forecast. Right now, for the hurricane forecast, we're doing pretty good for the three days forecast. Not so good for five days. When do you think we can expect the, the same kind of reliability for five days that we have now on the three days. That's the first part. Okay. Second part is how much confidence should we put on the long-term prediction of the, uh, from the IPCC of the climate for 30 years, for 10 years? What is the confidence that we should put on that and, and why? So the, the, free, the three to five year, excuse me, three to five day forecast question, I think you'll see that today we have the same degree of accuracy for the five day forecast as we did a decade and a half ago on the three day. So we're making that improvement and we're now getting closing in on, on closer to seven days with that same degree of accuracy. So over time our accuracy has improved and, and has given, I hope, you the confidence to be able to rely on the warnings that are coming from the hurricane. Uh, hurricane forecasters. Half of that hurricane forecast comes from the science that's done here in this university and right across the street in, in our NOAA lab, and the rest of that forecast is, is coming from the skill of the forecasters. So that three to five day is closed in. If you look back in time, we've closed that gap pretty quickly. So that's track. We're also working on improving our ability to forecast intensity because we do have these surprises where over the course of 12 hours or so, <clears throat> and a change of intensity can be far more dramatic than we had expected. We think we're on to why that's happening, but we now need to perfect it and bring that to fore. One of the biggest problems that we have in order to get to that point is the availability of high-performance computing. If, if we could solve, to me, if we could solve our challenge with anything, it would be more compute. The Congress has heard us, and they're trying to give us the relief that we need. But in terms of then the IPCC, the 20-year, 30-year, et cetera, projection, it, it's... Um, I think it's well labeled inside the report itself as to what degree of confidence. In fact, the authors of the report purposefully wrote that. And I'm going to ask Ben to offer his opinion on this because he participated in that. But the authors chose several years ago, several iterations of the assessment to basically give the public that level of confidence to invest in. And it is described adjectivally so that people can realize what level of certainty there really is. And it's a remarkably high level of certainty what we're headed for. Ben, is there anything you want to add to that? No, no, I think that's just a key number. <laughs> you don't need it. You don't need it. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. That was a wonderful lecture. Thank you all for coming. That was spectacular.